welcome everyone. Good afternoon um, to yet another session of Data Bytes presented by the Data and Society Research Institute. Data and Society examines uh, the social, political, ethical, and cultural issues related to a data-driven society. We are um, honored to have uh, as our guest today Maurice Mitchell, um, who works and co-founded Blackbird, talking about uh, hacking black democracy. And as is the custom here at Data and Society, we'll begin by um, some introductions around the room. But before I do that, and for um, Mo's benefit, as well as, um, well, yeah, for Mo's benefit mostly, I think, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask a few off-the-record questions that um, if you could show by, and you, if you could answer by show of hands, that'd be great. And I'm Sita Penyagang Gatterin, today's host. Um, I'm a 2014 fellow with Data and Society and also a senior research fellow at New America's Open Technology Institute. So um, what I thought we would do today, just to kind of get things going, is um, on this somber day, I would note, um, I thought we would invite uh, Mo to just share for about 10 minutes um, some thoughts about you know, how he's, wh wh who, who you are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what kind of work you're doing, what Blackbird is, um, and um, that should launch us into a conversation, um, I think, thinking about the intersection of racial justice and technology. So. Sure. Um, and uh, number one, thank you, Sita. Thanks for everybody here at Data and Society for hosting this. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, you have to forgive me if I'm a little somber or low energy. It's because I'm uh, just, re just emotionally responding to the, to the uh, terrorist attack that happened um, not too, a few hours ago in, uh, in Charleston. And I'm also involved in the rapid response around that. Um, so I'm, I might be a little bit distracted, but I'm trying to be present at the same time. So, um, so to answer your question, um, I'm, a, I'm an organizer. That's how I identify. That's how I understand myself in the world. I've, I've been organizing uh, for um, 20 years now. I started as a, as a youth organizer. And um, you know, organizing to me simply is uh, a tool for, for collective action, for people to figure out how to solve problems that they may have collectively. Um, and you know, there's all different forms and styles and trainings of organizing, but it's, it's that simple. It's, it's, not, it's not that deep. We've, in this country, professionalized organizing and it's become this superstructure that's tied to like nonprofits and all this other stuff, but it's just basically people getting together and trying to collectively solve problems like people have been doing since since they've had collective problems. Um, my interest in organizing comes from, you know, um, my lived experience as a, a black person, as somebody who lived in, a, in an immigrant household, as somebody who has interacted with the state in ways that have been very racialized and very violent in my, in my lived experience. And I've, uh, my, the personal trauma of witnessing other people in my family, in my community, also interact in a, in the, with the state uh, in ways that are very racialized and very violent. Um, so um, there's a, a certain level of urgency um, and um, personal stake involved in the, in the work that I do. Um, so, you know, why am I here? So um, August, early August, um, August 8th, I was um, executive director of the New York State Civic Engagement Table, uh, organization that helps uh, <laughs> progressive organizations from around New York State collaborate in meaningful ways um, to build power for their bases um, and to uh, work uh, on strategies to apply pressure on, on local and state government around a number of progressive issues. So, you know, um, income inequality, um, LGBT rights, um, uh, housing rights, um, racial justice, uh, you name it. And creating a space where organizations that traditionally won't work together work together because generally um, people's political targets are, are very similar. So figuring out how to um, 
work aligned versus work, work in separate sort of silos. So that, that, that work is what I was doing. On August 9th, um, Michael Brown Jr. was killed in, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri. And I, as well as many others, quickly learned of, uh, of the severity of that case and the mourning that that community was experiencing. And then the intense militarized response to the mourning that the local authorities had. Um, and you know, technology plays into this story, right? I mean, the, the initial piece of it is that uh, the people in, in Ferguson and the people in Mike Brown's community acted with uh, uncommon courage and leaned into risk and um, collectively organized and responded organically in ways that um, we haven't seen in recent memory. Uh, and we had the technology for other people to witness that. So I was able to see a live stream over the, over the next few days of the building uh, organizing and the intense militarized response. And uh, by day two or day three, um, I was on Facebook. I clicked on a live stream of Ferguson. Um, and I, it was pretty late. I was working on a grant report or something. And at, it just, you know, I think for me, the juxtaposition of me working on, on something like a grant report, and at the same time, I'm watching uh, young people um, get tear gassed for expressing themselves um, politically. Um, drove me to, to take some risk myself. And so um, I reached out to folks uh, in St. Louis and had some, some conversations about how people outside of St. Louis and outside of Ferguson could add capacity and support. And I decided to get on a plane. And you know, within a few days of Mike Brown's death, I was on the ground working with uh, organizations that I had some relationships with. And I, my, my trip was supposed to last five days. It ended up lasting five months. So I ended up relocating to Ferguson, taking leave from my job, and um, helping um, the local community and local organizations um, uh, build structures uh, in order to respond to that crisis and in order to organize in a crisis moment. Um, and so that, that is the, the genesis story of Blackbird. So the work that I did and the relationships that I built with other folks who, like me, came to to Ferguson to provide support, ended up uh, becoming a project that we call Blackbird. Uh, so Blackbird provides a few things. It provides rapid response, support to black communities in crisis. Um, so what does that look like? So in a matter of hours or a matter of days, being able to be on the ground or consult with people on the ground when a significant political crisis happens. Um, for example, somebody is is killed by the police and people are mourning, people need all types of organizing support, all types of legal support, all types of communication support. And um, you know they don't necessarily have the, either the infrastructure or because they're so close to it, they're just reeling from the crisis moment that they need additional support to kind of, uh, that, uh, of people who have some critical distance from the, from the trauma in order to, to help build uh, some long-term infrastructure. Um, so the rapid response moment in Ferguson has, has pivoted into sort of a reality where we're constantly responding rapidly. And it's not as though, you know, overnight police officers have decided to kill black people. It's, it's a, it, the reality is um, this moment has visibilized the invisible. So these deaths were invisible. People, black people get killed a lot in, all types of situations, and it never was important enough to make news. And um, the one intervention in this moment is the fact that um, black people's lives are valued enough that when they're killed extraditionally by the state, it is news. And when it's news, it, it, it causes uh, a political reaction, a communications reaction, an organizing reaction. Um, and um, People like myself and our team try to respond in ways that um, are not extractive, that support long-term uh, sort of infrastructure building and organizing, um, that um, surfaces leaders and builds connection to a larger network, and also creates some um, forward motion 
towards alignment around long-term sort of structural changes um, versus, um, you know, somebody gets killed. It's a deep traumatic shift for folks. There's cameras everywhere for a few weeks. Um, there's a big boom and bust of energy and a community is left, you know, struggling in shambles, disconnected and worse off. Um, so what we attempt to do is at the very least, make sure that communities are connected to a large network of folks who are struggling around these problems and that um, we um, attempt to cushion some of the more um, predatory and extractive energy that happens in, in those environments. Um, so that's Blackbird. And just to, to get a sense of the, the larger ecosystem that, that uh, Blackbird lives in, um, many, how many people have heard the phrase Black Lives Matter, right? Okay, so basically everybody. Great, we're doing a great job, good. <laughs> All right, um, and, and you know, Black Lives Matter, um, that hashtag and that phrase and the organizing effort around it was developed um, by three women um, in response to the Trayvon, Mar the, the, uh, Trayvon Martin killing, right? And it's been a very important frame and a very important intervention for us. Um, and it's eventually become an organizing network. Um, so we work very closely with people who identify with, with Black Lives Matter and the organizing network. We work, we work closely with organizations like BYP 100, Black Youth Project 100, which is a national organization that does base building. We work with local organizations that are, are space-based and are focused on specific communities like Organization for Black Struggle in, in, uh, in St. Louis, Ohio Student Association in Ohio, Dream Defenders in Florida, and uh, you know a pretty long list of organizations that are doing the long-term organizing in their communities. And we also work with organizing networks um, you know, like Project South um, and Song that, that uh, build network across uh, various pe peoples and organizations and entities around the country. And when you, when you put all of those different entities together, you have a pretty vast decentralized network of activists and organizers who are in communication, who are developing in the sophistication and the speed and the intensity of of their ability to, com to communicate and also to respond and organize. So um, I'll give an example. Um, how many people are, are familiar with the Baltimore uprising that happened recently? Okay. So, um, you know, we were in communication with folks on the ground who have been doing organizing for years in Baltimore. And um, when, when folks felt there was a need to do um, to do solidarity actions or actions in line with what was happening in Baltimore, Baltimore, because we are in communication with this vast network of, of individuals and organizations, um, us and our partners were able to call solidar solidarity actions in 48 hours, and there were solidarity actions, um, dozens and dozens, um, over three countries um, in the span of two days, right? Um, so that's, that's the power of network organizing and decentralized organizing. That's, you know, democratic, um, pretty flat, but also coordinated um, and um, becoming more and more aligned around a certain set of principles. So Blackbird does that work kind of behind the scenes. Like, how many people have heard of Blackbird? Right. So we do that work behind the scenes. We're not a forward-facing brand or anything like that. We're a team of people who um, support the movement and movement building and create containers um, in order to provide um, the movement um, an ability to have that that conversation, that decentralized, democratic, but coordinated conversation. Um, and so when people see these actions around the country and people are sharing a common frame, a common hashtag, uh, common language, um, common demands, it's, it's not by chance. It's not because somebody just tweeted something in the air. Um, basic nuts and bolts organizing, trust building, relationship building, um, all of that and network building went into allowing that to happen. And it's um, what we continue rely, to rely on now, almost 10 months into the, this particular movement moment um, in order to, to do our work. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll share, because this, you know, this is uh, data and society, right, is how we interface with technology. And I don't know how I'm doing time, but OK. So um, I mean, I would say this. I would say that 
as a as an organizer and when I'm on the ground in working class black communities, and when I talk to people in general, I, I don't I don't know many people unless they they their their job is to focus on technology who consider technology as a separate distinct thing. Um, I think most people interact with technology as a, an extension of something that they're trying to do. And um, you know, the basics of organizing is the ability to build relationships, build trust, and build network. And you know, we've, we use technology for that purpose. Um, and, and we use different tools for that purpose. And whether or not people understand those tools as technology or, or not is secondary, secondary. But we don't necessarily think, um, I guess we don't think, like, how can, we, how can we use cool technology to do our work? We attempt to do our work, and when, when we find barriers, we attempt to, to find tools to, to get over those barriers. And we generally have limited resources, so the tools that are the most readily accessible are the easiest to access um, are the tools that we use. And some of them are, um, you know, technological. And we constantly are trying to innovate because um, we, we have huge stakes, very limited resources, and a lot of work to do. So we're constantly figuring out how to be more efficient, how to be broader, how to, um, you know, how to stay on the cutting edge. Um, and also, you know, the, the effective action of today won't necessarily be the effective action of tomorrow. So we have, we have to constantly innovate and escalate, not, not, not necessarily in, in scale, but escalate in terms of um, sharpness of, of the tactics and um, the actions that we do. Um, so, you know, one of the technologies that we use a lot is SMS texting. And, you know, I think as, you know, as open rates of emails continue to decline, like, you know, and as the technology, the ability to own a cell phone becomes cheaper and cheaper, it, um, it actually is a meaningful way to communicate with people. And with, in this particular moment, with the need for rapid response communications, um, and specifically the need to withhold information until, until almost a specific moment, during very specific direct actions, for example, having SMS and building SMS lists and being able to segment them and being able to do two-way communication with people through SMS is really helpful. So the fact that we could communicate with them, they could text back, we could give them, deliver them information specific to them um, has been very, very helpful and has allowed us to um, innovate um, in terms of being able to do um, being able to lead, um, like in St. Louis, for example, we led maybe two dozen direct actions in one day, and a lot of the underlying technology was SMS that allowed, allowed us to do that. And we were able to stay ahead of, of the um, police and the local authorities while um, being able to communicate to our people. So we were able to communicate with a large number of people to, uh, to execute the action. Um, and stay ahead of police. And the way we were able to do that was by withholding information at certain points and then using SMS to share that information. And so, um, and as we, you know, and then the flip side of, of technology is what we've seen is high, as, as our movement has grown, as the political stakes have grown, and as the, the um, and as we've formed more and more of an existential political threat to some of our political targets, We've also witnessed surveillance, um, and some of it is just basic surveillance, like you know, um, the um, from local police, you know, sort of following well-known activists, um, both online and physically, right? So you know, um, you know, following people's um, online identities, um, developing a profile of them, like this you know, figuring out through their online identities that these people are, are well-known activists, uh, you know, filming and uh, photoing people on protest lines, and then, you know, and then, and then surveilling them pretty heavily. And based on that surveillance, being able to pick them up on, on minor charges, you know, it's like if you surveil any human being 24% of the time, they will commit some crime at some point, you know. Um, and so, crime, you know, quotations at some point, and then using, using that as a pretext to, um, to apprehend people, apply pressure on them, attempt, attempt to get them to flip and become uh, assets for, 
the local authorities to continue deeper surveillance. So all those things are things that we've experienced. Um, that type of um, broad <coughs> dragnet approach of, of uh, pulling people in, trying to extract information from them, trying to get people to, try, you know, intimidating people um, while they're in police custody, even if they don't have meaningful charges, and attempting to get them to essentially flip and become assets um, for the purpose of surveilling people's political speech, right? For, so this is, all of this is using the police apparatus to intimidate and uh, surveil um, people around their political speech. Political speech that the police just don't like or the authorities don't like. And because they don't like it, they use a lot of their resources to, to, to do that type of surveillance. And then, and then of course, you know, um, uh, or well, not of course, but we know now it's verified, like The Intercept um, published an article around um, a specific case where there was some online surveillance happening around an action in, in Minnesota where they were following Black Lives Matter there around an action at um, the Mall of Americas, right? And so, and they involved, in that particular case, the, you know, the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, which includes the FBI and local authorities, were in, involved in that. So we know that there's some level of targeting of our specific movement, and I think the thing that we're most concerned with, or, or not, one of the things that we're concerned with is not just our specific targeting, but the ability through, um, through passive sort of surveillance to be able to, to uh, uh, to take in a lot of information online um, through our phone conversations, through our texting, uh, um, around all of our activities, and then maybe at some future date um, use that to develop some profile of who these activists are, what they are, and, and, and based on the future threat that they may see, you know, they'll have um, significant uh, data in order to um, in order to target us, so these are things that we're concerned with, and you know we're 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 thinking around how to how to solve for that. I mean, one of the ways is just you know being super transparent, and um, and also not allowing their surveillance to to somehow um, uh, take us off our game and put us you know send us into the shadows because everything that we're doing is technically. Um, constitutionally protected political speech, and um, so we're gonna act like it is, right? Um, so those were my four main points, and if you have any questions, I know it kind of ended in a very anticlimactic way, just kind of super abrupt, but if you have any questions, I, or Sita, if you have any questions. So I, I have many questions, Okay. I, but I actually, um, I wanna bring us to the present day and think about the context in which we're having this conversation. Because I, I mean, I also want to respect the fact that you're here talking with us when you can actually be, do, be doing rapid response in Charleston and across the country yeah. and so on and so forth. Thanks. So I, I just want, if you can, share with us um, what some of the work that you're doing right now um, so people kind of understand what, what it means to be engaged in, in, this, in this space. Because it's, mm -hmm. I mean, what you've described um, is not abstract in any way, right? It's like very, <laughs> it's very material. It's very, like everything you've said, including what you've said about surveillance and surveillance technology, it's, it's about us, our bodies, ourselves, our communities, yeah. places. Like presence. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about um, Charleston. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, like, so I'm glad that you brought that up. And any, any conversation around technology or data in relationship to, to organizing, because organizing ultimately is about people, I always have to just ground it in people's lived experiences, right? And so um, yesterday when we heard about Charleston, you know, I immediately thought about the folks that we met in Charleston. We were doing rapid response. So rapid response can mean a lot of things. It can mean that in a crisis, we get on the phone with folks or we have conversations with folks and, and consult remotely. Or it can mean that folks invite us to their community and then we do some deep organizing in that community like we did in St. Louis and what, like we've done in other communities. So we were actually on the ground in, in, 
in North Charleston when um, video of the police officer murdering Charles Scott surfaced. And the video uh, showed the police officer murdering Charles Scott as he was running away and planting evidence on his body, right? Um, and the authorities there actually charged the police officer with murder in that case. Um, so we met a number of people there. We built some relationships that continued after we came back. And so just personally, thinking about all those people, thinking about the people in the faith community we met, and understanding how tight-knit that, that black, the black community in Charleston, North Charleston is, you know, um, the massacre of nine people in that church is going to have an intense, traumatic uh, effect in that community, and also just black communities in general. Because, um, you know, I could tell you that you know the folks I've been talking to outside of that community are just super emotionally triggered and traumatized by that experience. And so, in this, in these particular moments, um, in these heightened moments, you know, rapper like people who do rapper response are, are called to to do their work as they're experiencing this trauma, right? So I'm experiencing the trauma. You know, a friend of mine, her cousin was, was killed in that church. Um, and, you know, we have to surface what are the key contributions or the key interventions that need to happen in this moment. I think one of the things from, from a communication standpoint, um, a lot of our work, and this is super troubling, but the reality, a lot of our work is just around um, staking claim to black people's humanity. Right? And so if black people are in fact human, then logically certain things need to follow from that. Right? Um, and, and if black people's humanity is in fact um, uh, equal in value to the humanity of white people, then if you do a thought experiment, certain things should follow. So um, white person um, invades a black church, massacres nine people in it. It's a terror attack. Right? If, if, if a person with a Middle Eastern background or a Muslim background um, could break into a synagogue in New York and massacre nine people, and that's a terror attack, and the value of the life in those cases are equal to the life in these cases, then this should be a terror attack, right? So the, the media framing around this is, is different, right? So in this case, you know, already the media um, is, is, is fixated around the, the emotional sort of and, and mental state of, of the, the killer, right? So centering it on him and his unique human qualities, right? And who he is as a person and what could have made him do this and all these types of things, right? Um, generally, when black people kill black people, there's, it's almost, it's just like that's, there's, it, the, the idea of black violent pathology is so deeply embedded in our culture, there's no need to have a conversation about why that happened or what the emotional state of the person was, right? Um, you know, the, the, the idea of anybody, of anybody, any foreign person killing anybody, like it's just, of course, there's some sort of like broad cultural pathology at play. And, and when white people kill people, those are individual people who there must be something wrong with them because normal human beings don't act in this way. And so um, underlying that is, is the, this basic white, supremacist, white supremacist tenet that white people and whiteness is normal, human, and, um, you know, and white individuals are individual people, and everybody else are broad, broad categories of other, right? And so in this particular moment, you know, one of the interventions is just staking claim to black humanity, right? And uh, making clear that, that this, in fact, is terrorism, right? This is white terrorism against black people, right? Um, and making sure that the individuals, there are nine people that, kill, that are killed, a lot of the work that we're going to do is elevating their stories so people, people know them, people know their unique stories. They understand who they were as, as unique human beings with passions. With, and, and, you know, this is 2015. This is way past the civil rights movement. This is um, way past, you know, this is on the, the, the uh, sort of the twilight of the Obama era, right? It's still hard work 
in the media, interpersonally, institutionally, to um, defend and articulate black humanity. It's really hard work because there's no anchor in our culture for it. Um, you know, um, that's, that's why black, that's one of the reasons culturally undergirding the ability for black people to be killed by the state in the way that black people are killed by the state. It's the fact that deep down in our culture, there is a conversation around the, legitimately, the legitimacy of black humanity. And that's something that, that white people take for granted. Like, I'm a human being, I'm an individual. If some white person does something crazy, that's some other person doing something crazy that has no bearing on who I am. Um, that's, that, is a, that is a white privilege, right? People of color have to contend with the fact that we are part of a racial class that um, is viewed as a whole. So my blackness means that regardless of whatever my personal passions or my story or who I am, or what family I came from, or where I lived, where my skin presents as a certain thing that puts me at high risk for being, being killed by the police, uh, being jailed, you know, being incarcerated, all these other things, right? So my, my individuality is something that I hold and I carry, and I'm in constant negotiation with my society and my state around whether or not I'm in fact an individual, right? Um, and so, which means, you know, just to bring it back to my personal lived experience, by the time I was, I was you know, by the time I left my teens, I had already been wrongfully arrested by the police, um, wrongfully charged by police, you know, beaten up by police, you know, pulled over the, by the police a number of times, right? And so the, the um, sort of elegant um, power of segregation is that I could experience that, right? And then a white person who is equally situated, same age, socioeconomic background, whatever, doesn't experience any of that. And so when I say this society is racist, that white person could say, what are you even talking about? Like, I see the police all the time. They don't do all those things. Like, you know, and, and um, there is a segregation of experience and a, um, a concentration of, of harm um, that often doesn't get ex explored. Part of, part of um, what technology has been doing is by showing these videos is that it, um, is in some ways um, expanding the conversation and beginning to give some insights into, into the, the, the reality of the harm that exists in black communities and that's, 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 that's concentrating in black communities. So, so thank you. Yeah. Um, that was a pretty long answer to whatever, <laughs> sorry. No, that's great. Yeah. And I actually just want to acknowledge that this is a very difficult conversation to be having, and it's a difficult conversation to moderate. So I just want to respect that. Um, and I, I, I do want to open it up um, to the floor for questions. And if I don't see any hands, um, I will um, have another question. Get in. Mike. Um. I don't know, this, this may be the wrong question for this forum, and Dana, feel free to shut me up if it is. The, the word terrorism, you explain the choice of that word with reference to the numbers of people who are killed. But we don't use the word when we're talking about, let's say, someone who goes on a rampage and kills 20 kids at a school, um, or goes and does that in a movie theater. Um, we... And I'm not sure that we would use the word if, let's say, a black person went into a church and killed nine white people, and I'm not sure you would want us to use that word either, because that would imply that the, the kind of, it seems to me that would imply the very thing that you're trying to avoid, which is the idea that um, there is, I mean, you know, it, it, would, it would somehow be used to imply that, like, black people are against white people and want to kill them all. You know, the, applying the label of terrorism is used in a way to demonize a class. And so, while it's absolutely right that it's a, it's a racist society, and so the, the act of this white guy can be seen as an expression of that white racism, I'm not sure that terrorism is, it feels to me like it opens a can of worms to use that word in this context. So, 
it's an interesting conversation. So, I mean, I think, um, I think before I answer that, we should settle whether or not terrorism is a word that should be used. Is there, is there an appropriate application of the word, right? And if there is, um, like, I, like, I don't think it's about this, I don't, I don't think it's about the scale, but I do think that um, my understanding of terrorism is that, you know, when the purveyor of terrorism is attempting to make a political, political point with their act of violence, right? And so in this case, this particular person, um, this is like clearly a hate crime, right? And so uh, this person is fueled by a specific political ideology. And, and that is the impetus for his attack, right? Whether it's nine people or, or two people or one people, one person. And um, I think it's likely if the person was Middle Eastern, regardless of the, their political implications, that there would be a, a um, overwhelming case, whether or not it was valid, that it was in fact terrorism. I think the, I think the facts of this case, if we're using the the definition I shared, which I think is a problematic definition, because then you know a lot of you know a lot of things that you know our state does is terrorism, right? Um, but if we use that definition, and if there is an appropriate application, I think this is is this is neatly within that within the that application. Um, I think I think the reality is that black violence in the context of the United States. Um, or the way that people view the, when, when the um, perpetrator is black, how people view that person is different. And I don't think terror, but I think, you know, language like that person is a thug, this is a product of thug culture, it's a product of fatherless societies. Uh, there, there are other tropes and other stereotypes and other broad um, ways that people understand that that go along with it, right? But it's, you know, um, I think, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's fair to argue whether or not terrorism is a useful word for anything. But if it is, I think this case is pretty clear. Dana. So first, thank you for the work that you're doing. I mm -hmm. think this is phenomenal. It's great to actually hear some of the context in which the things that we see uh, have a logic to them. Um, did I hear you right that you said you did some union organizing in the past? I've done a lot of organizing. Um, not, um, I've worked with unions, but union, like actually organizing rank and file union members is not something that I've done in the okay. past. I guess part of what I'm curious about is that a lot of organizing as it got structured for a large period of you know, the last 100 years was about organizations, entities, memberships, you know, structures. And a lot of what you're talking about is this phenomenal way of trying to think about building networks as part of building movements that are not just about a series or set of organizations, but a set of peoples coming together through all sorts of different ways. And this is the thing that becomes fascinating about technologies. To what degree does it help connect people on scale fast, mm -hmm. um, and therefore the rapid response? So what I'm curious about is, as you're seeing these new opportunities to connect people without having to do it through organizations necessarily, although you know, through faith-based communities, through a whole variety of other collections. How does that change what you see as the core strategies of organizing when you're trying to think of it in a networked oriented way and when you're trying to think about leveraging tools to enable massness through networks as opposed to through institutions that have been previously constructed? Sure, so I would say that it's not an either or thing. Organization, from my standpoint, organization is, is actually super important, right? Um, in these particular movement moments, people, if, if there's a number of interventions that, that happen through organizing, one of the most important ones, I think, is um, when somebody moves from someone where essentially things happen to them to somebody where they, their relationship to the, their reality shifts and they make things happen, right? It's a very different orientation, right? So a lot of that happens in, through organization, traditionally. In these particular moments, they happen um, sometimes through mass mobilization, sometimes online, where people make that shift. Um, one of the things that we attempt to do is create platforms where a number of people could get access to information, plug in, 
you know, go to rallies, do online actions, and feel like they're a part of the movement or a movement um, without necessarily having to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a grassroots organizer. Um, so that's been happening. At the same time, I don't think that the core of organizing ever shifts because we're still people and um, we are, I, I believe that we um, understand ourselves in relationship to other people and we built, through building trust and building connection to other people, um, we're able to do collective work. That could happen online, that could happen outside of an organization, um, but the core is building, building trust and building relationship. And, um, and so the core doesn't change, the tools change. Um, in these particular moments, I think in order to go to scale, um, the, the way that we, we on-ramp people or bring people in, those things shift. But in order to maintain a number of those people, like not everybody in this particular moment, when thousands of people have hit the street, not everybody's going to stay a part of this movement. But in order to ma maintain enough of them, we need to create and we need to develop um, containers and homes for them. They may look like traditional organizations, may look like something networking, may look like something in between. But people, um, in order to sustain movement building, people need homes, right? Um, mass mobilization in itself doesn't create political homes for people to do long-term organizing building. Um, it's an opportunity to unwrap many people to, to develop a basic level of, of consciousness raising, but then there still requires work to, to, um, to create spaces where those people, those thousands of people, could find uh, meaningful ways to, to, to have conversation, to come up with solutions, to build trust, to build community, to, to develop healing, to all these things. And that often requires face-to-face -face interactions with people. Um, you know, and I don't think it's an either or thing. I think sometimes the, the technology can be helpful in that. Um, but I think um, the, core, the core of organizing is building trust, building relationships, and you know, technology, we see technology as a way to, to, to aid that. And I think um, just to, just to close the loop around the, the organization question, I think um, how we understand what organization is, is, um, is uh, needs to be more fluid, right? Um, what I saw on the ground in St. Louis was like people building organizations in the matter of hours. Young people deciding like we're, okay, we're, you know, um, you know, we're the freedom fighters. You know, it's a group of young women who you know, over, this, over the course of one day, I, I saw them, they were not organized as that group, they were working together. Then they, they developed the name, they created a Twitter account, they were the Freedom Fighters, right? They don't have a 501c3, they don't have, you know, but they're an organization, all right? And the way that they move and the, flu, the fluidity of their organizing and organization is very different than a member-based organization that has a bunch of organizers that do one-on-ones, but both organizations. Kathy? Thanks so much for coming. Um, yeah. So I, it's kind of a, I'm adding a little bit on to this previous thing. When we're talking about like organizing a sustained way, um, my experience as an occupier, you know, is like, well, I wanted to facilitate a group every week, and I have a friend who's a professor at Columbia, and he got us a room, mm -hmm. you know? so we can do that yep. and it's happened for four years and it's great, but it's like because I have resources, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking at the other, <clears throat> the, you know, other, there's other groups at Occupy, like Occupy Evolve, there's the um, Stop Mass Incarceration Now Network mm -hmm. and they're constantly, because they're in my group as well, so I'm talking to them about their, their organizing struggles and they're, they are struggling with technology and how to get the word out to their members. So I'm really interested in hearing exactly how the SMS stuff works. But, but the biggest thing is they can't find a regular place to meet. Like mm -hmm. they, they were at the Riverside Church every second week, but then the pastor was pushed out so they don't have that space anymore. So I, I kind of feel like, um, you know, like that's a big piece of the, and there's, there's, they have fewer resources. Yes. And, you know, so, so how do we, and not, not only that, but obviously the, the Zuccotti Park is not a place where that they're welcome to meet. There's like, there's no public space for them yeah. either, especially in the winter. So I was just wondering how you guys in your network address that on a longer term uh, scale. 
I mean, if any suggestions and how technology yeah. can be used. Yeah, I mean, I, what I think you articulated is a, a structural challenge. You know, I mean, there, the, the reality, reality is physical space is really important in, in organizing. Because people, there, there's still a, a value um, in people meeting physically and all the things that happen in a physical space, not just the meeting, but, you know, the, you know, building signs and art builds and uh, strategizing and having a safe space and all those things. That, like, you need physical space for that. And there's creative ways of thinking, thinking about it. And, you know, a lot of times churches have come in handy. Um, you know, um, sometimes there are organizations in, in communities, you know, sometimes there aren't. Um, so it continues to be a, a, a challenge. Um, it's not, it's not any challenge that we figured out some sort of magic solution for. It's something that, you know, is, is a barrier. And I think, you know, our communities don't have access to as many resources and, are, and, and have not been resourced or organizing, black organizing and black-led organizing has not been resourced and has not been uh, supported um, in the same way that other, other forms of organizing has been. And as a result, there's a structural imba uh, imbalance in in what we could do, and that is one piece. Like we don't have access to as m many physical spaces, and um, you know, I mean, one of the things that we do do, right, is we do a lot of conference calls, right, and conference call technology is relatively cheap, and it allows hundreds of people to be able to have a conversation, and so that's something that we do quite often is we do the conference call because um, we could relatively either f f through you know through free conference calls or low-cost conference calls bring a number of people together, sometimes across large distances. Um, and so that technology and like buy-up technology and the fact that it's made it possible to do that. And years ago, like conference call technology was pretty, something only corporate people used and it was really expensive. It's not something that regular people could get access to and it's actually helped. So that, I mean, that's a way that technology has seamlessly sort of helped close that loop. But you know, we still, but yeah, like people still need to, to do certain things in physical space, so it's still a challenge. No. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the resources perspective. So after um, the Dean campaign uh, and the fall of the Kerry campaign, the new organizing institute was created. Yeah. Um, your previous work, or uh, previous or current work, which you happen to be on hiatus, also is about building capacity within organizing. So um, w besides Blackbird, what are the other organizations that we should be looking at that do capacity building in this 21st century organizing way? Um, you know, who are your allies um, uh, or slash competitors? Um, and um, yeah, uh, I'll just ask that question. Yeah, I mean, so I'll answer it this way. I'll say this. Um, we work in a pretty collaborative um, field that's constantly shifting. Um, Blackbird plays a distinct role, um, but we share work with the Black Lives Matter network and all of, our all of the various partners that, we, that I mentioned before. Um, that's all I'll say. Okay. But, uh, so yep. just um, like Tibet Action Network or Tibet Action Institute, like, do, do, are there ones? There's any other ones that we should be aware of, Did or maybe Tibet, I'll just Tibet Action Institute. Yeah, T A I. Okay. Oh, so that organization exists in a in a different um, organizing ecosystem. Okay. So we might be doing similar things, but in parallel realities. Okay. Yeah. So I want to ask um, a question. So again, I want to acknowledge that it's a challenging conversation. It's also, I think, challenging to have a conversation um, in a community that is pr primarily thinking about data or technology and to really theorize what racial justice and, and hear what the labor of racial justice organizing is. 
Um, and the question that I want to ask you is, um, in the work that you've done in the recent almost nine months, I guess now, ten, ten, ten months, yeah. um, what has been most useful? I mean, we have a number of people mm -hmm. here that work on data and inequality, that um, think about technology and inequality. Mm -hmm. um, what has been most useful for the movement? Um, like what kinds of interactions with technologists and or people that think about technology or advocate around technology policy, what has been the most useful in those interactions with um, the racial justice movement? Well, I, you know, so there's, there's been a few, I think, really helpful uh, projects. There's been a lot of great conversations, right? But, you know, one, you know, so Patrice Cullors, who's one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, who founded Dignity and Power Now in uh, LA and is currently working at the Ella Baker Center. She's partnered with the ACLU, of, um, ACLU around this, an app, um, uh, an app that could easily film police activity and upload that information um, even, if, even if the person filming it, like if the phone is dislodged or whatever, whatever wherever that, wherever that uh, the video stops, it'll be immediately uploaded, right? And there's an, a number of other features of the app that allow people to document police interactions with, with citizens, right? And so that's something that, um, you know, Patrice was able to collaborate with them on and um, could be super helpful because, you know, another, another intervention culturally in this moment is that people feel more emboldened to, to document police activity, right? And so tools that allow us to do that in a more effective way, in a way that's um, anonymous. So we've been having conversation with folks around how to document police activity in an anonymous way so that things won't, because in, in some of the high, higher profile uh, cases, people who have documented these cases have, been, have then been targeted. So um, the person who filmed the Eric Garner um, video, he was targeted by the police. He ended up in jail, right? Um, and so there's a level of um, exposure that, um, and intimidation that people might experience. So figuring out how documentation could happen in an anonymous way. So we've been in communication with people around that. Um, and we've been in communication with people around um, communicating and some of the tools that allow folks to communicate and develop a network um, outside of, outside of um, uh, the use of uh, of Wi-Fi, right? So, you know, if there's th thousands of people who need to communicate with each other during a, a direct action and there's no Wi-Fi or there's no cell service, how are we communicating? And, and the, those tools have been really helpful figuring out how they apply. Um, so, you know, um, they're easy, they're easily accessible, they're cheap or free, um, and they're relatively simple to operate. And then also the streaming technology you know, live streaming used to be this techie thing, but now it's, it's, become, it's become technology that, that most people, especially like most millennials, could, could easily operate with very little um, sort of, very, there's a small barrier, there's a small barrier to like, to, to use of that technology. So all those things have been very helpful and to the point where, you know, in any of our actions, we always embed a, a live streamer. That's just is what we do. And then on the flip side, during any direct action, you will see police officers. There will be a police officer whose job it is to video people. There will be a police officer whose job it is to take pictures of people's um, faces, right? So, um, so as we, you know, as we shift in technology, also the authorities are are using technology in order to 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 um, for their own purposes. So, I want to get a. Um Check on the time. 120. So we have about 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to go to Emily and then go to the room. Thank you. So I'm glad you brought up the issue of how terrorism is defined because although you're talking about the media, I think it also pertains to statistics and how coming up with definitions of things can be applied unequally. And I was wondering. Um, if you use statistics in your work or if there's any kind of data collection you feel is missing, such as we've all learned 
recently that there's no federal tracking of um, you know, how many people are killed by police. Is there anything else like that that would be helpful? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so we don't even know how many people are killed by the police, right? And so The Guardian has done some really great stuff around that. Um, I mean, that, if you would have asked me um, earlier, like not too long ago, I would say like, yeah, that's a major data problem that we have. Um, I think internally, being able to track our activity, so we, we're not even clear, you know, there's been uh, more than, more than a thousand sort of planned actions over the past 10 months in every single state. Um, and I think us just documenting the enormity of this particular political moment a as we do it is something that we're, we're grappling with. And us wanting to be able to document our story in an in a accurate way, um, I think is super challenging. Um, and most, you know, most of the, re the, uh, the reporting around the work that we're doing um, you know, is, is framed either in a way that is inaccurate or using inaccurate information or um, is framed around a certain set of politics that we just don't agree with, you know. Um, so I think figuring out how to use data in order to effectively tell our story and, and document um, the actual movement building is super important. Um, I think another thing that I'm really, really interested in, and um, so this is, you know, it's actually like, in the little blurb about this, but I didn't really get into this. So like, you know, from our perspective, you know, our analysis is that, you know, black communities are essentially dead zones for democracy, right? And um, demonstrating that numerically, I think, would be, would be and definitively, um, is something that I'm really interested in working on. But essentially, if you, more than likely, if you, if you are born black in America, you're you're born in a black neighborhood, in a black family that lives in a black neighborhood because this is a very, very segregated country, right? Um, so it's very likely, it may not be the case, but it's very likely. And in that case, if you are born in a black neighborhood, you're, bo you're born in a place where voting probably doesn't matter because um, there aren't contested elections locally, there just aren't. Um, and um, chances are you, are going to have a horrible public education, like a horrible one. Um, and chances are that the actual physical environment and the infrastructure, right, of your community is substandard, right? And something like infrastructure has, has nothing to do with the actual community, right? Like, it's not like the cars that, that black people drive are, are built in this way where, like, we produce more, uh, you know, uh, more potholes, right? It's just like, but if you're driving down Nostrand Avenue up until very recently, because it's, it's, gent it's like Crown Heights is gentrified, when you know, like, there's, you will know when you're in a black neighborhood by what is happening to your car, right? Infrastructure is something that's supposed to be like evenly applied everywhere, right? But it isn't, right? So down to, down to the block, down to the infrastructure, down to every single aspect of that physical reality, if you're born in a black community, you're probably black. And then you, you um, experience something that's very distinct in terms of your lived experience and your interaction with your, your, your state and your interaction with your democracy, both the political democracy and, and the, the political economy. So your reality, if, if, if black people lived in a distinct state, you know, that was distinct from the United States, it would be a, the, it would be a very, it would be something akin to um, a, another country, right, someplace else. And so um, we're very much interested in demonstrating that numerically and um, uh, using research and data to prove that, right, to prove that definitively um, and to have a, um, a broad understanding of what democracy is because I think it's, it's just based on lived experience and also based on some, some of the data that exists, I think it's pretty clear, like around policing, around criminal justice, around healthcare, around the environment, around rates of asthma. I mean, every single measure you could possibly imagine, by virtue of just being born a particular race in a particular country, these things are true for you. And so, um, as, or, as somebody who's organizing black communities, it's helpful, helpful for me to frame things like that and frame the difference um, 
because I think it's often glossed over. And I think one of the, um, again, um, segregation works because it concentrates all those things in a particular place, right? And it allows, it gives white people and white middle class people the, the privilege to simply not live in that reality and to simply assume that that reality doesn't exist and to maintain a status quo that calcifies that reality, right? And so what we want to do is democratize that information and um, we want to, um, there's, it also concentrates discomfort and I think the work that we, we do is, um, is also about democratizing discomfort, right? So um, if we're going to be dis uncomfortable and we live in the same country, you're gonna be uncomfortable too, right? And then we could all deal with the, this uncomfortability together, right? And so I think develop some of the data will, will, is actually helpful in doing that. And so some of the work, some of our, our, our um, actions are around, around democratizing discomfort, right? So, and it's also around creating, um, creating absurd sort of um, um, really intense emotional reactions from people, right? So we're, we're marching because actual people are dying, right? And we stop traffic, and people get pissed off because they can't get to where they're trying to go to on time, right? And so there's something absurd about the fact that you're more angry about the fact that traffic is slow than people are, are actually dying you know, every single day in your community, right? And so creating that, that juxtaposition is actually really helpful and, 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 and sort of democratizing discomfort I think is really helpful in, in, point, in, in drawing that out and, and um, exposing the contradictions, those, those contradictions that, ex that we, we live with, but we live with in silence, so. I'm gonna ask us to batch the questions, so we'll go in the back and then to Dana, and then I'll end with a question as well. Um, it's okay, my, my question was kind of just answered in a way. I just wanted to follow up uh, for a moment on some of the surveillance issues that mm -hmm. you uh, have raised. There is no doubt that technology is being used to surveil uh, black communities in unprecedented ways. Mm -hmm. What do you see as effective, uh, obviously we want to stop it on the front end, we want to stop it on trying to make certain that this becomes legal in different ways, mm -hmm. but what do you see in the meantime on the back end in terms of community organizing, in terms of making certain that communities understand what's at stake mm -hmm. and helping give them the tools to protect themselves um, from the kinds of surveillance that could further harm them? Sure. So. I, I, Okay. I'm going to batch my. I'm going to append my question to Dana's um, because I know that we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, so we just have a few minutes left. The question that I want to ask is, um, I think complementary, but thinking about the future, right? So if we're thinking five years, ten years from now, mm -hmm. when we're in a different movement moment, um, you know, <laughs> where will what? <laughs> where do you envision? direct action and community organizing at that stage? And, and, and what might it be focused on? Because, um, you know, it might be racialized surveillance today and police violence. It might be something else tomorrow. So how do you sustain that Sure. In the so let me try to answer those questions. So I think to, to answer your question uh, contempor <coughs> contemporarily, how, how are, are black people or people in black communities or, or people who are organizing around black communities, um, dealing with state surveillance, I think it's important to historicize it, right? So, so um, the experience of black people in the Americas is, is a direct result of transatlantic slavery, right? And in order for that operation to work, it, re it required the development of, of a very elaborate, very intense, very expensive surveillance apparatus. The only way you could completely and wholly colonize a, the 360 of somebody's reality and, and to be able to extract labor from somebody in that way, especially when you're in slave plant, plantations where the enslaved Africans outnumber the, the white folks, right? Like, the, surveillance is required for that, right? Um, it's, my, it's my contention that um, 
the, the modes of surveillance and the tools for racial control have shifted from, from slavery to Jim Crow to you know, the prison industrial complex. And, and this is also um, something that Ms. Michelle Alexa Alexander, she, she offers. But the underlying need for a number of reasons, for economic reasons, for uh, you know, deeply um, held cultural reasons, for deeply held reasons around um, racial anxieties and uh, in order to maintain uh, a certain political status quo and economic status quo, um, there's a need to, um, for social control of black people. Um, and the surveillance that, the intense surveillance of every single aspect of your being that existed during slavery has shifted into other types of surveillance. And it's, it's still very real. Um, we are aware of it because, for example, um, if you walk in a black community, you will notice that there will be a number of police officers who are not from that community on the street surveilling the people who live in that community. Just surveilling them as they you know, go to the store, drop their kids off, whatever. You know. That is actually like the reality of living in a black community. There's just like a bunch of police officers, like either you know, uh, undercover police officers in their cruisers, you know, uh, plain clothes cops on the, on the block, sometimes you know, a number of them. Um, these like little like robot looking devices, right? You know, white people who live in suburbs and middle class neighborhoods do not see these things. It's just, it just isn't a reality. Um, so we, like, it, the state actually puts a lot of resources into making it clear for black people that we're being surveilled, right? Because they could actually do these things in ways that are clandestine, but they, you know, it's, there's a, there is great effort put, in, put into explicitly making, making sure that we understand, like there's like cameras that aren't concealed all over our communities. It's, it's really clear and we know that. We're very aware of it. Um, and depending on our, the struct, the, Depending on our, our threat model, based on who we are and what we do, we have different ways that we um, interact with that surveillance. But there is, a, there is a, a underlying threat because, again, you could be anybody doing anything, and it's likely that you will interact with law enforcement, which is essentially um, the very expensive, very elaborate um, method of social control that has that has um, taken the place of the plantation, um, you know, like it's very likely if you're black and you live in a black community, you will interact with them. And, it, and it's very likely that that interaction at some point will be negative and arbitrary, right? And so there's tons of things we do from, you know, black parents um, informing their black children how to respond and all the various micro sort of ticks and the various ways you're supposed to operate when you interact with the police officer, you know, from, you know, you know, I think um, at a certain age, you know, there, many black people have a pretty sophisticated understanding of what you can and can't, or what you legally could or could not say to a police officer and what questions they will ask you. Um, so I think, I think there's probably a more nuanced understanding of surveillance in black communities than in probably any other communities outside of may, maybe, maybe Middle Eastern and Muslim communities after 9-11. So I'd answer it that way. And then I would also say that um, in terms of what we're trying to build, um, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we could build political homes that are democratic, that are dynamic, and that are real because you know, my other contention is that black people don't have political, political homes for us, for us to be able to do our own organizing um, and also our, our own, that, that is distinct and, and uh, s that is not connected to status quo state power, right? Because um, a lot of the, the political homes that, that do exist are designed to, to, to neutralize black political power, you know? And so many of the political homes that exist in black communities um, 
are so wedded to status quo power that they aren't meaningful places for actual democratic thought and organizing to happen. So I would hope in this moment, as these new formations develop, that we develop um, organic, self-determining um, sources of political power that aren't connected to political parties or connected to essentially status quo power, where we could develop our own solutions you know, in our own ways. So I hope that that, that can happen. So if, if these uh, chapters of uh, Black Lives Matter and BYP and other things, if we continue to strengthen them, support them, nurture them, um, you know, I, um, I feel very hopeful about what the future could look like. So. so on that note, resistance, resilience, and building a home, thank you so much for joining us Thank today's you. database. Thanks.